here's a picture of the classic sensory motor homunculus. Um, so the sensory part of this is on S1, and this is kind of organized along this principal sulcus that separates the posterior cortex, the back of the brain, from the frontal cortex, the front of the brain. And so on the, on the back part of it, the posterior side of it, you have the sensory aspects, and you can see that they're perfectly aligned with the motor aspects on the uh, frontal side of it. Um, and so, you know, your sensory inf information about where your lips are and your teeth and all the stuff that's going on when you're talking is all organized, you know, right across the way from the same areas that are important for organizing the motor actions associated with those parts of the body. Okay, I'm not gonna say anything about the plumbus. Now we have the Brodmann's areas, which is another way of thinking about different cortical areas. This is a widely used numbering system developed uh, based strictly actually on anatomical grounds on the relative thickness of different areas in the brain. Uh, here again is this, you know, area 17 primary visual cortex uh, and then, you know, other areas kind of radiating out from that. Um, and so it turns out there is a specialization that you can understand in terms of the anatomy, in terms of the thickness of the different kind of little layers that make up the cortex. Uh, those do differentiate uh, function in these different parts of the brain. And so as you go on in cognitive neuroscience, for example, you would become very familiar with these different you know, kind of random numbers here. So like area 44, 45 is Broca's area and, and people kind of generally know that. Um, so, and then this is the kind of outer surface, the lateral surface of the cortex. And uh, uh, this other view here is on the medial interior surface of the cortex. As a generalization, the lateral surface tends to be more about sensory motor processing and the, the medial surface tends to be more about uh, affective, motivational, quote unquote, limbic areas of processing. This area here that's labeled as not well studied ends up being really critical for understanding how uh, we systematically organize our representations of events in the world. It's called the retrosplenial cortex. So you won't be tested on any of these areas. Don't worry, you don't have to memorize the Brodmann's areas, just kind of pointing it out uh, for future reference that, that, that there are these kind of large number of dissociable kind of different sub areas of the cortex. Okay, as mentioned earlier, there's a, an important difference in the different pathways uh, going down into the temporal lobe, the ventral visual pathway, important for encoding kind of what information, uh, object recognition, face recognition, what, what's out there in the world as distinct from the dorsal pathway going up into the parietal lobe. This was originally studied in monkeys, this is a monkey brain showing the same kind of organization. Uh, so this is a really important way of understanding what the kind of posterior cortex, how that's organized in terms of visual processing. Um, and there's a lot of work that's been done taking those same kind of visual areas and organizing them according to detailed patterns of connectivity into this hierarchy, okay? This notion that information kind of flows in a particular direction through the brain. And that was captured in that earlier diagram here that I showed you uh, of information going from V1 to V2 up, up in the infratemporal lobe pathway. That's this pathway going up into these blue areas here. And that contrasts with this um, where pathway, really the, the kind of how pathway, how to uh, use visual information to organize behavior going up into the parietal lobe um, on the right-hand side here. Uh, so these are all areas of parietal lobe. Um, and here's that area V3 that I mentioned earlier. Um, it's kind of intermediate between the, the what and where pathways. Um, and so it's kind of interesting. And one of the interesting things about this version of the diagram is that you have the uh, frontal eye fields, the uh, area that controls eye movement, all the way down playing this really critical role at the very low level of the visual hierarchy in terms of these connectivity. And so even though anatomically that area is way up in the frontal lobe, in terms of the kind of network type connectivity diagram, it's much more tightly integrated and in very low level into how our visual systems are organized. And that reflects this critical role that visual attention plays as we're kind of looking around the world, um, as, as we'll see in the perception chapter, 
we only sample a tiny amount of the visual world in any given fixation. And so we're constantly moving our eyes around. And so knowing where to move your eyes really requires having that, that kind of area very tightly integrated with all this visual processing. So you can get a lot much richer understanding of how the brain is organized looking at these detailed patterns of connectivity as compared to kind of just this overall gross anatomy. So again, as we mentioned before, the net result of this kind of layers of hierarchy building one atop the other is this ability to compress the visual input and take you know this high resolution visual stream coming in and turn it into these very abstract high level concepts which are then very important for uh, driving behavior okay so to summarize uh, this is the level at which you need to kind of you know know the information for a test so occipital lobe is important for vision temporal lobe is important for object and face recognition also for hearing audition speech language and semantics uh, Parietal lobe is really important for space, number, action, and this somatosensory, primary somatosensory S1 uh, part of the brain. Uh, and then frontal lobe is really important for control, most of all, uh, involved in primary motor representations at the most posterior end of the frontal lobe, and then on up into the higher levels involved in this kind of executive function that integrates motivation and affect and all this kind of really important knowledge about what do you want how do you feel uh, how does that then guide what kind of behaviors you're going to perform uh, there's a whole story about left hemisphere versus right hemisphere if you were tracking what i was saying about the temporal lobe versus the parietal lobe a lot of the popular stories about that uh, left versus right sound very similar to that 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 sort of like the left hemisphere is very important for you know, specific, discrete understanding, verbal knowledge, uh, whereas the right hemisphere is more kind of broad and spatial and intuitive. Um, and so there may be some aspects of that that are uh, actually, you know, kind of mixed across the hemispheres as well. Uh, but certainly I think the evidence for the differences between temporal and parietal lobe are a lot more well-established uh, in the literature compared to left versus right hemisphere. Okay, and then to summarize as well, the rest of the brain, as we said before, the hippocampus, very important for encoding these episodic memories. It actually sits on top of all that kind of visual hierarchy and gets a very compressed understanding of the uh, overall state of the brain and then takes these snapshots and pictures of what's happening in the rest of the brain. The amygdala, very important for emotional uh, representations, uh, guiding uh, fundamentally the association between arbitrary stimuli in the world and our kind of emotional reactions to them. Uh, basal ganglia, critical, critical for making decisions uh, and, and deciding essentially what should we do based on the track record of what has worked in the past. As we'll see in the learning chapter, dopamine plays a critical role in training up the basal ganglia. Thalamus is kind of directly point to point interconnected with, with the cortex, very fundamentally inseparable from what happens in cortex. Uh, and then cerebellum is playing this kind of adjacent role of training up and learning about how to do fine motor control, how to refine our motor actions to make them more efficient, more effective, less error prone. Anytime you learn a new sport or new skill, it's all about training up that cerebellum. And then the cerebellum then in turn trains up the rest of the cortex to, to do that function.